We wish to acknowledge this land on which Wycliffe College at the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Welcome to the Religion and Society series event, What Does It Mean to Be Human? Ghosts and Machines. My name is Karen Stiller, and I am your extremely human host for this evening of insights, challenges, and meaningful conversations, including your questions with three fascinating thinkers wrestling with an extremely important and timely question. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Julian Mussolino, Dr. Michael Murray, and Dr. Jordi Rose to lead us in the discussion, what does it mean to be human? This evening is sponsored by Wycliffe College, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, Faith Today Magazine, the Centre for Inquiry Canada, Ravi Zacharias Ministries, the U of T Secular Alliance, Network of Christian Scholars, and Power to Change. The Religion and Society series is designed to generate critical dialogue on matters of faith, society, and public interest. Tonight we are participating in an important conversation on a topic that matters deeply, which seems to me a very human thing to do. We welcome you, and we welcome the many live streaming sites joining us tonight. Here's how things will proceed. Each of our guests will speak for 20 minutes. Then we will engage in conversation here on the stage, giving our speakers an opportunity to interact with each other. Then we will take some of your questions. Please ask questions via Twitter, hashtag religion and society. Our team up front will then select and share questions with me via text. So now it's my honor to briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Julian Mussolino is a cognitive scientist, public speaker, author, and associate professor at Rutgers University in the psychology department and the Center for Cognitive Science. He is the author of numerous articles and very recently the book, The Soul Fallacy, What Science Shows We Can Gain from Letting Go of Our Soul Beliefs. So that sort of tips his hand. Julian's recent work focuses on the implications of the science of the mind for a range of issues. He has appeared on television, his work has been discussed in popular magazines, and he has been a guest on radio and podcast programs in the US and, and abroad. And now he is here with us, welcome. Dr. Michael Murray is Senior Vice President at the John Templeton Foundation, overseeing the Foundation's grant work in the natural sciences, philosophy, theology, and public engagement. He is also Senior Visiting Scholar in Philosophy at Franklin and Marshall College. He is the author of numerous articles on the history of philosophy and the philosophy of religion, and has recently authored or edited the books Philosophy of Religion, Nature Red and Tooth and Claw, Theism and the Problem of Animal Suffering, The Believing Primate, Scientific, Philosophical and Theological Reflections on the Origin of Religion, on predestination and election, and divine evil, the moral character of the God of Abraham. Welcome, Dr. Murray. Dr. Jordi Rose founded D-Wave, the world's first quantum computing company, and Kindred, the world's first robotics company to use reinforcement learning in a production environment. He has sold quantum computers and robots that learn to Google, NASA, Lockheed Martin, The Gap, and several US government agencies. Jordi is a two-time Canadian national wrestling champion, which I think is important for us all to know on the stage, and was the 2010 Naga World Champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He was named the 2011 Canadian Innovator of the Year, and was one of Foreign Policy Magazine's 100 Leading Global Thinkers of 2013. In a fascinating twist, for a short time, Jordi also held the Guinness Book of World Records record for the most yogurt eaten in one minute. <laughs> so, yeah, that is super impressive. So we are really happy uh, to have this group of speakers here tonight, and we're happy that you're here as well. 
Let's get underway. The order of our speakers is first Michael Murray, then Julian Mussolino, and finally Jordi Rose. And I will prompt each of you at the right time. I'll remind our speakers they have 20 minutes and we do have a timekeeper in the front row. Dr. Murray. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, so we had originally, we were, we were going to do a, uh, an arm wrestling contest at the end to determine who's right, but I didn't know all that stuff. So I just want to tell you that deal is off, like I'm not doing that. Uh, anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here and um, really glad to have the opportunity to spend some time with all of you thinking about this uh, very deep and important question. Uh, what does it mean to be human? And i um, really grateful to Wycliffe Hall for putting on this event and to Karen and, and Jordi and um, Julian for uh, joining in the conversation. So I have one little technical thing I have to address here. There we go. So the question that we're confronting today, I just need to get my slide up here. Oh, it's up on the side, great. So the, the question we're addressing tonight is one that really has very deep significance for how we think about ourselves and our place in the world. And there's good reasons why it's a question we need to address today. Um, as we've learned more about non-human animal genetics and behavior and cognition, the apparent gap between human beings and other animals has shrunk shrunk to the point where many have begun to question whether or not there really is any significant difference between humans and non-human animals. And the view that there is such a significant difference is one that's played a substantial role in many religious traditions and the understanding of human beings within those traditions. In addition, as AI devices acquire more of the strategic and computational abilities of humans, it's become harder to figure out what, if anything, distinguishes us from these inorganic computing devices. And as various technologies have given us the ability to modify our genetic makeup, as we've been reading about even in the news very recently, we're confronted with what is and what should be the limits or the boundaries of humanity. At what point do we, will we, can we modify human beings out of existence, into extinction? And is it okay if we do? Each of these topics could occupy us for much longer than an evening or a semester. Um, I think my role here as the Christian philosopher tonight is to speak to some of the distinctively philosophical and theological issues that arise surrounding this topic. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, Sorry, I didn't advance that. So let me give you a little outline of what I'm going to do. There are two things that I want to do in these short remarks. The first is to take a look at what we're learning from recent scientific work about the questions of whether human beings are unique amongst living organisms in some interesting way. That's the first question. And the second is whether or not the findings of the sciences of the mind, psychology, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence, should lead us to conclude that we're nothing more than complex, organic, material computing devices. Those are the two things I want to do. So let's get started. So if you ask, I think, the average reasonably scientifically informed member of the academy or of the general public whether or not human beings are distinctive or unique in any significant way, I think most people would answer in the negative. I think that's the general consensus on the street. Most of us are aware of the fact that characteristics that were once taken to be unique to human beings, things like phenomenal consciousness or abstract reasoning or causal reasoning or dispositions towards altruism and so on, um, at one time, we thought those were unique to human beings, but recent science has shown us that, in fact, uh, many animals have those characteristics, at least in some form, and if we differ, the differ differences are only incremental or a matter of degree. But as, that wide, as widespread as that narrative appears to be, I think the pendulum in the sciences has actually swung in the other direction in the last decade or so. And what we've been learning in the words of Stanford primatologist Robert Sapolsky is that while every species is unique, Humans are uniquier, or something like that. Um, and that might not be an exact quote, but here is an exact quote from British evolutionary biologist Kevin Leyland, who puts the point this way in his 2018 book, Darwin's Unfinished Symphony. He says, oh, this is very small on my screen. Um, Darwin and his intellectual descendants have substantially shrunk the recognized differences between human and animal cognition relative to the strict dichotomy that was accepted in the Victorian era. Yet the distinctiveness of human mental ability relative to that of other animals remains striking, and the research field of comparative cognition has matured to the point where we can now be confident that this gap is unlikely to be eroded completely. A hundred years of intensive research has established beyond reasonable doubt what most human beings have intuited all along, 
that the gap is real. So how should we think about human distinctiveness? Well, first of all, there's a need to acknowledge that human beings are, uh, in many ways, like other mammals and, and primates. In some respects, we're no different from other mammals and primates. That's clear. But in addition, there are domains where human beings have certain basic design plans that they share with other mammals and primates, but utilize them in unique ways. And third, there are domains where there are things that human beings do that just have no precedent anywhere else in the animal kingdom. So let's take a look at a few of those. So first, as I said, we're mammals, and in many ways we share characteristics with all the other mammals. Like them, we have circulating blood, we have hair, we regulate our body temperature, we give birth to live young, or at least the female members of our species do. And, um, and we're like those mammals in other bizarre ways, too which I would love to tell you about, but then I would run out of time. So if you want to hear about those bizarre ways, we can come back to that um, in the Q&A. But let me begin by looking at one phenomenon that um, makes us a little bit different, uh, or at least we utilize this uh, trait in a little bit different way. Um, and it uh, comes from a phrase that, or that's described by a phrase in psychology that unfortunately is not a really apt description of what it's about. So the phrase is theory of mind, and if you have known anything about psychology or co uh, cognitive science, you have heard the phrase theory of mind. And all it really means is our ability to infer the thoughts and desires, the mental states of other beings. That's what theory of mind is really all about. And in the not-too-distant past, it was assumed that theory of mind was something that was unique to human beings. Now, I don't like the phrase theory of mind, as you probably have guessed, so I'm gonna use the word mind reading, because I think that's a more apt description. Uh, so mind reading was what was thought was to be uh, unique to humans, but we've learned that that's not really the case. And you can see that um, with pr other primates, for example, you can set up an experimental situation where you have a cage with two doors, and outside the two doors, you place a dominant and a subordinate male. And you may have a barrier in there that is um, uh, opaque, and you can go in and hide some, or put some food in the cage. And if it turns out that the, it's put in such a place that the dominant male can't see it, and the subordinate male can see that the dominant male can't see it, then when you open the cage door, the subordinate male will run in and grab the food. But if you instead use a transparent screen where the dominant male can see where the food is placed, and the subordinate male can see that the dominant male can see where it's placed, and you open the door, the subordinate doesn't do anything. Subordinate knows that the dominant male can see that the food is there, that the dominant male is going to get it, that he has no chance until he just doesn't even try. And so what does that show? Well, it shows that there's some mind-reading ability on the part of these uh, other primates, right? That they can see what the other, they can know what the other one knows, and as a result, choose to behave in a way that's appropriate to what they know. So some of these things we once thought were unique to humans, now we know that they're not. But there are other kinds of mind reading that we're capable of that, as far as we know, no other animal is. And this sort of mind reading is important. So while other primates might be able to infer the thoughts, intentions, and beliefs and desires of others, here are a couple things they can't do. So first, they can't engage in what's sometimes called second order or higher order mind reading. So they can't do the sort of thing that we do when we're thinking about what she is thinking about what that guy thinks about her or about me, right? That's something that they, they can't do. Only human beings can do that. And uh, our ability to do that turns out to be somewhat important, not only because it gives us the ability to watch shows like The Bachelor, um, which, as you can now see, would be utterly baffling to any other primate, but because it allows us to understand what other people are trying to accomplish and to work together to accomplish it with them in ways that they understand as my attempt to carry out a common task with them. Only we can do that. They know that I know that they want to do this task and that I'm doing what I'm doing in order to help them do the task. Only we can do that. And this sort of thing, as far as we know, emerged at a crucial juncture in the evolutionary history of our lineage. Um, emerging around the time that we uh, became, moved from being tree dwellers to being terrestrial dwellers, to dwellers, from being relatively scrawny uh, primates who had to learn to cooperate with others in certain kinds of tasks in order to survive. Tasks like cooperative hunting and foraging. And the only way we could do those sorts of tasks is to be able to join together in common efforts to do things like bring down the large game. And to do that, you had to know that I knew what you were trying to do so that we could collaborate in such a way to bring about this goal. 
This sort of collaboration is known as joint intentionality, and as far as we know, it's unique to us. And part of the reason that's cool is because it allows us to engage in the most meaningful of human activities, the relationships of love and friendship. To love someone is to understand what they value and to endeavor together to secure those things for the good of the other. But to be able to, to do that requires this very complex cognitive machinery. And it's machinery, the machinery of second order mind reading and joint intentionality, that evolution seems to have conferred uniquely on us. So that's pretty interesting. So that's, I'll call that one and a half ways that we're distinctive. Uh, souped up mind reading that allows for the consequent ability to engage in joint intentional behavior, the crucial skill that underlies our ability to love and befriend. But we're unique in another way, and I want to explain this distinctive from a few different points of view. So first, one way of putting it uh, is that we're hyper-imitators, especially of those that we regard as having high prestige of some sort, or of those who are in the majority. And there are many experiments that show this, really fascinating experiments that show the degree to which we're prone to this hyper-imitation type of behavior. But I don't have time for that in only 20 minutes. But you don't really need any experiments. All you need to do is to recognize a phenomenon that we're all familiar with, the phenomenon of celebrity endorsements. So why does anyone care that Rihanna wears Pumas or Willem Dafoe likes Snickers? Why does anyone care about that? I haven't the slightest idea, but marketers think that people do care about it, and it turns out when celebrities endorse these products, people buy them in massive numbers. Now, why is that? And the reason is because we have this innate disposition to imitate the behaviors of those who are high prestige individuals. But why do we have that? What's the, what's the explanation for that? And the answer seems to be that much of our ability to survive and to reproduce is not due to our strength, because we don't have a lot of that unless you're Geordie, or brain power, it's rather our ideas. And by our ideas, I don't mean our, our individual ideas, I mean the ideas that we have together as a culture. The ability we have to rack up ideas and to pass them along is something that uh, cultural evolutionary theorists call cumulative culture. And it's because we're so very dependent on cumulative culture that we get very good at internalizing knowledge and practices of others in our community, especially those who seem to be succeeding. So that's the majority, or again, these high prestige individuals. So our ability to accumulate cumulative culture through this hyper imitation is a very important distinctive of human beings. We don't find anything like that in any, other, in any other animals. Not to say that there isn't social learning. There just isn't this accumulation of culture that's passed on through teaching and apprenticeship that you find with human beings. And it's one of the things that explains what I think many of us think of as some of the most important, significant aspects of human life and behavior. Art, literature, science, sport, religion, and so on. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this, this is just kind of a side note, is that these two and a half, I'm calling them distinctives, are strikingly concordant with the way human beings are understood in the Judeo-Christian religious traditions. So on these traditions, God created human beings for two purposes. First of all, to be stewards of creation and to love God and one's neighbor. Those are, I think, arguably the two reasons why God created human beings according to these traditions. And um, what's interesting is that it's through cum cumulative culture that human beings are able to be stewards of creation. It's through cumulative cultures that we're able to survive, navigate, and influence every environment and niche across the globe. Amongst multicellular organisms, human beings are unique in the, that they can inhabit any environment that's out, that's out there. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. But as I mentioned earlier, second order mind reading and joint intentionality are also special to human beings, and these seem to be the distinctive abilities that allow us to engage in relationships of love and friendship. So if we were to have taken our guidance about what would emerge as special and distinctive about human beings from these religious traditions, we would have landed in a place that's pretty close to what contemporary science is converging on. So rather than, in this case at least, rather than science undermining our confidence in uh, these religious traditions, it is concordant with what these religious traditions teach. Okay, so while there are many ways in which human beings are like other animals, there are important ways in which we're distinct. 
And while these are important for evolutionary reasons, they may be important for other reasons as well, for signaling to us what's important and significant about human life and perhaps the purposes for which we were created. All right, so let me move on to the, to the second part of this, and I've only got a few minutes left, but fortunately this goes fast. So, um, in the second part of the remarks, what I want to talk about is whether or not the contemporary sciences of the mind give us reason to tr uh, jettison traditional conceptions of the human person. And by traditional conceptions, I mean conceptions that are framed in some way around the notion of a non-physical soul or part of the human person. And um, as many of you might know, the idea of a soul is held in low regard by neuroscientists and psychologists in these days. Um, and um, I myself am agnostic about this. I really don't know what the right thing is to think. Um, but I want to tell you some reasons why I'm ambivalent and try to make you ambivalent as well if you're not already. So first of all, two preliminaries. One is um, there are a variety of types of non-physicalism. There's not just one. So according to one form, human beings have substantial immaterial souls that causally interact with bodies. Um, but there's also a f other forms of non-physicalism where rather than the soul being a separate part, um, it's more like this, this is a bad analogy, but um, a statue you might think of as having both the metal and a shape. And some non-physicalists have a view according to which the mind is sort of like the shape. It's a part, but not really a part you can separate. Right? So it's first of all important to recognize that there are different varieties of physicalism. The second preliminary is this. There are different ways to approach the question of what the mind is like. So one way is empirically. That's the way scientists do it. They will do scientific experiments, gather empirical data, draw inferences from that data, and from that they make a determination of how the mind works. Um, but that's not the only way. Another way we can approach not just the sciences of the mind, but the world we live in is what you might call conceptual. So conceptual approaches are different uh, than what we do in the sciences, but they're still valuable. And I can give you a really terrible illustration of this as follows. So imagine I tell you I have a coin in my pocket. It's a special coin. I want to know if you want to buy it. And what's special about it is that it's square, but it has no corners. Now, what you're going to say to me is, I'm not interested because I know you don't have that coin. And the reason you don't know it is because what I described to you is conceptually impossible, right? And that's a perfectly legitimate form of reasoning that helps you understand what's in the world. And we use this in other places as well. The classic argument for atheism from the existence of evil works like that as well. So it's not an unusual form of argument. Um, and it's one that's deployed by philosophers, especially when it comes to thinking about the mind. So I want to give you just I've got two minutes and 39 seconds. So I've got three arguments here. We'll see how many we can get through. If we just get through two, I'll just give you two. So when it comes to um, physicalist conceptions of the person, that is views that uh, reject the idea of any immaterial component, there's lots of good empirical evidence in favor of the physicalist view, but there are conceptual arguments that leave some of us worried that maybe we haven't gotten the whole story. So here's the first one. One of the most deeply rooted beliefs we have about human beings is that we have free will. And that free will is part of the reason that we can be blamed when we do bad things and be praised when we do good things. But if I do a bad deed as a result of being drugged or hypnotized or mesmerized by a mad scientist, I'm not responsible. The person who hypnotized or drugged me or mesmerized me is responsible for that. Um, so if we're merely physical entities, it looks like we just can't have free will because what we do is just a consequence of the laws of nature moving through us like billiard balls moving around on the billiard table. So on this argument, the idea goes like this. If we have free will, we can't be merely physical entities because physical entities can't have free will. All right, here's a second one. Anti-physicalists generally see the mind as... Um, uh, sorry, physicalists generally see the mind as physical, organic, computational devices. And computational devices work by taking inputs, doing computations on them, and generating outputs. And uh, Alan Turing, the famous philosopher and mathematician, invented this uh, proposal for determining whether or not such a machine uh, is artificially intelligent. Roughly the idea was, if you can't distinguish that machine from, uh, a, a, from a normal human person, then you should regard that thing as artificially intelligent. And so... One problem is that it looks like we can create a device that passes the Turing test, but that isn't artificially intelligent, or it doesn't have the characteristics that we typically associate with a human being. And this argument focuses on the notion of understanding. Okay? So on this argument, derived from the work of the philosopher John Searle, there's a room. 
And in the room, you put pieces of paper with little things, uh, symbols in Chinese written on it. It turns out they're questions in Chinese. And in the out box, you end up getting strings of symbols that are written in Chinese that are good answers to those questions. And in the box, you have a guy with a set of books. And what this guy is told to do is to take the questions that are put in, identify what these symbols are, write out an answer over here in, with these other symbols, and slip it out the other side. And maybe the guy gets really good at it, really fast at it, so that he can take the input. Doesn't even have to look at the books anymore. Writes sends it out through the out slot. Now, somebody on the outside looking, looking at this thinks, oh, this computer is really good at understanding and responding to Chinese questions. It must understand Chinese. The problem is, the guy in the box doesn't know Chinese. He does not understand Chinese. He's an English speaker who's been given instructions for how to use these books. And if that's right, it looks like you can get a room that passes the Turing test, but lacks something really central for being an intelligent agent, and that's understanding. So the question here is, um, can you get a physical thing that has the property of understanding? And according to this Chinese room argument by Searle, the answer is no. Okay, I've got one more, but time is up. We can come to that later if you like. So the, the conclusion here is this. Conceptual arguments are not unimportant. They're the sort of arguments that led Einstein, for example, to make the discovery of general relativity. And until we've been able to conclusively respond to these, we at least ought to have a measure of skepticism about whether or not the physicalist program, the anti-soul program of neuroscientists and psychologists is the correct one. Thanks a lot. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having all of us here tonight. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here with you this evening. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank a number of people. First, I want to thank uh, Steve, if he's somewhere right there, for putting this event together, for organizing it, Steve and your team. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, Karen, for uh, helping us with this. And of course, thank you all for being here tonight. So, uh, as you heard earlier tonight, I'm going to be the villain, uh, and I'm going to be responding in a way to some of the uh, claims and arguments that, uh, that Michael made, and I'm really looking forward to the interaction that we're going to have uh, later. How does this work? There we go. So, the, the question before us tonight, what does it mean to be human, is a question that many of the greatest minds in history have pondered, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to be able to uh, do it justice in, in a mere 20 minutes. In fact, even if I had more time, uh, the best I could do is give you a particular perspective on this question. And because I am professionally a cognitive scientist, the uh, perspective I'm going to give you is the one from the cognitive sciences, namely the sciences of the mind. And, um, Keeping, in keeping with my metaphor about elephants, no connection to my political affiliations, I assure you. Uh, <laughs> I live in the US, by the way. Uh, I want to tackle the, uh, the elephant in the room. And if you wonder what this is, I'm going to tell you. But first, I want to say that what I'm going to share with you tonight is going to come across, uh, perhaps to many of you, we are, after all, at a Christian institution, as rather provocative. But I'm not doing this to be provocative gratuitously. I'm doing this because the ideas I'm going to share with you are ideas that the overwhelming majority of people in the sciences and in the sciences of the mind happen to share. And I would like to explain to you why it is that we think the way that we do on such a crucial question. Uh, what's the question? Well. We've often heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. A video clip is actually worth 10,000 words. So let's watch. So if any of you are driving home tonight, I would suggest that you do buckle up. 
uh, heaven can indeed wait. So this is, of course, the question of the soul. And for the longest time, uh, many of us uh, in many places have assumed that what it means to be human fundamentally is to have a human soul. This is a question that I have addressed uh, at length in my 2015 book uh, with a title that kind of gives away what I think about the, uh, the question uh, called the, uh, the soul fallacy. And um, tonight what I want to do is not talk to you about the entire book. I'm not going to have time, but I want to do two things. The first is give you uh, the main claims that I make in the book and encourage you perhaps to buy the book. I hear that it's available uh, here. It's a nice coincidence. Um, and then I want to focus on a subset of these claims and uh, try to tell you why, again, we in the profession in which I uh, happen to be think the way we do. The first claim that I make is that the traditional soul, and here I want to pause for a second, because I'm going to be very clear about what I mean by this. One of the issues when we talk about complex questions like the soul or consciousness is that they can mean many things. So I'm going to be very clear about what I mean by the traditional soul. And I'm closing the parenthesis. Uh, that the traditional soul is not just a theological or philosophical or metaphysical claim. It is, in fact, a scientific claim. And that's very important because a lot of things follow from that. If this is true, and I really think it is, and it's not hard to show why, then this means that the existence of the soul is something that we can decide objectively. We know, we have known for a few hundred years now, how to evaluate scientific hypotheses. And I'm going to suggest to you that modern science gives us every reason to believe that human beings do not have a traditional soul. This, in turn, has a number of implications that extend far beyond the realm of science and bear on questions, broad societal questions, of concern to all of us here tonight and at large. And the book ends on a positive note. Uh, th that positive note is that the uh, demise of the soul is not something we should worry about. It's actually something we should rejoice over and embrace in the sense that we lose nothing, I believe, by letting go of our soul beliefs. And in fact, we have something important to gain. I'm going to focus tonight, at least for the purposes of the presentation, that I'd be very interested in, in the conversation we're going to have with Michael, with Jordi, and with all of you, uh, to tell you more. But I'm going to focus on the first uh, three claims. So first, we need to be precise about what we mean by this notion of the soul. Because as you know, it can mean many things. So how do we approach this? Well, one way is to simply try to find out what most people believe when they tell you that they have a soul. And that's not hard to do. There's data on that. <laughs> people can be asked questions and polled. And there are different sources of data. So in my country, for example, in the US, uh, which is a very religious country, by the way, as you know, uh, these are data from global polls that suggest that for decades now, an overwhelming majority of the population believe in some version of the soul narrative, believe in life after death, believe in human immortality. We also get evidence and data from uh, reading books where people explicitly try to make claims to the general public and say, look, this is the kind of soul that we have and here's why we think we have it. There are quite a few books of that nature in, uh, in bookstores in the United States and around the world. A few years ago, I became very interested in what my own students think. People who are educated, to whom we teach classes in neuroscience, cognitive science, psychology. And I've conducted careful studies to see what they think with very detailed questions. When you put all this together, what emerges is a very clear picture. And it's the idea that most people in the US and many around the world today believe that human beings have a soul that, have, that has three key properties. The first is that it's believed to be immaterial and non-physical. You heard M Michael mention something along those lines. The second is that people believe, most people, not everybody of course, believe that their soul is what I call psychologically potent. 
Now that's my term. What this means is when you ask people what their soul does for them, they'll tell you things like, it gives me free will, or it gives me my personality, it gives me a moral compass, it gives me the ability to fall in love or to make decisions. These are psychological traits. So the soul is believed to be psychologically potent. And finally, of course, it's supposed to be immortal in the sense that when your physical body dies, disintegrates, your soul is supposed to carry your consciousness into the afterlife so that you can recognize Uncle Fred in heaven, for example. That's what I'm going to call the traditional soul. Now, of course, this is not the only way one can define the soul. I grant you that. But what's fascinating is that that's the soul that most people believe in. And if it happens to be true, it would be extraordinary because we would learn something very important about what it means to be human. And the answer would be that we're part beast, part angel. And I care about trying to find out. My job, in fact, is trying to find out what is true, what is likely to be true. That's what I'm paid to do. Now, if you move away from the general public and move to uh, academia, the sciences, you find very different positions on this. This is a quote from uh, Joshua Green, who is a cognitive neuroscientist at Harvard, who says that most people are dualists, body and soul. Intuitively, we think of ourselves not as physical devices, but as immaterial minds or souls housed in physical bodies. We scientists take the mind's physical basis for granted. In fact, there's lots of evidence, we'll see. Among the general public, it's a touchy subject. Indeed, it is. Here's another quote from a well-known philosopher of mine, Owen Flanagan, in a book called The Problem of the Soul, in which he writes that there's no consensus uh, yet about the details of the scientific image of persons, but there is broad agreement about how we must construct this detailed picture. First, we will need to demythologize persons by rooting out certain unfounded ideas from the perennial philosophy. Letting go of the beliefs in souls is a minimal requirement. In fact, desouling is the primary operation of the scientific image. If I had time, I could tell you more about the history of the evolution of soul beliefs to show you how accurate this quote is, but I'm not going to have time to do that. We also have data on what scientists think. This is a survey that was published in the leading journal Nature in 1998, two decades ago, and what you can see is that at the turn of the 20th century, 1914, about a third of elite scientists, members of the National Academy, believed in the soul narrative. Now watch what happens as the 20th century unfolds. This is 1933, this is 1998, 20 years ago. The overwhelming consensus among elite scientists is that we do not have such a, uh, a soul. So now, what's fascinating to me is that we live at a time when we have two competing worldviews that coexist. One that we find within the general public, which is a version of dualism. That's the ghost part of the subtitle for tonight, Ghosts and Machines and what most of us in the sciences believe, which is a version of materialism. That is to say that human beings are a biological uh, version of the Terminator. Of course, we're not programmed to kill Sarah Connor, that's not the point, but the idea is that we're physical through and through. Now, I want to show you uh, that this idea, this idea of this, what I call the traditional soul, is in fact a scientific hypothesis. And this comes uh, from two main reasons. The first is what I call uh, detachability and autonomy of function. The claim, again, that people make tacitly sometimes, sometimes explicitly, is that the mind is really independent and can function independently from the body. You die, but your consciousness continues to exist continues to allow you to perceive and think and reason and everything. Um, well, there could be evidence that this is the case. Suppose, for example, that we could talk to the dead. I'm not saying that we can. There's no evidence that we can. But if we could, if you had Uncle Fred's ashes in an urn and you could communicate with Uncle Fred under controlled conditions, that'd be spectacular evidence that something mental can go on in the absence of the physical. Or when people have near-death experiences and they report subjectively feeling that their soul temporarily left their body, float around the room and can see and hear everything in the room, if we place laptop computers 
on top of one of the cabinets. And if upon regaining consciousness, these people were able to tell you precisely what was on the laptop, whereas their physical body from their more restricted vantage point was not able to see what was on the laptop, we would have very good evidence that mental things can happen outside the confines of the body. This has been tried as no such evidence. But there could be such evidence, which makes the claim a scientific one. The second uh, reason why the claim is scientific is that the soul has to causally interact with the physical body to make things happen, to make you think what you think, to make you feel what you feel. People, after all, tell you, again, indirectly, that their soul is psychologically potent. Well, any claim you make about any kind of substance, wherever it comes from, that can interact with the elementary particles in the system is a claim about physics, and therefore it's a scientific claim. So now we have two hypotheses, to be a bit more precise. We have a dualistic hypothesis on the one hand that tells us that human beings are composed of a physical body and an immaterial, psychologically potent and immortal soul, the soul that we defined earlier, the soul that most people believe in. Body and soul are distinct entities on this view, and the soul can continue to exist and function independently from the body after we die. So to give you an analogy, it, analogies are never perfect, but imagine a, uh, a radio set, and imagine that you tune it to your favorite station and you start listening to music, and someone says, well, where does the music come from? Well, the idea is that this physical device interacts with a signal in the form of electromagnetic waves, receives it, decodes it, and plays music. If you were to smash the radio set to bits and destroy it, you would not destroy the signal. You'd have independence and detachability. Replace metaphorically now the radio set with your body, your mind with the signal, and you have the dualistic hypothesis. The materialistic hypothesis, on the other hand, the scientific uh, uh, view that people hold today, claims that the mind the domain of the modern soul, it hasn't always been the case, cannot function separately from the body for the simple reason that uh, our mental experiences are caused by physical activity in our brain. So what we call mind in professional circles is nothing but a description of the functioning of the brain at a certain level of abstraction. The mind is an abstraction, not a thing. Uh, body and mind are therefore two sides of the same coin. Imagine now a music box on this analogy. You start to uh, turn the little crank, and it plays music. Now, if you ask the question, where does the music come from? The answer is it comes from the physical operation of the parts and the way they are arranged. If you smash the uh, music box to bits, that's it. No more music. Replace now the body with the music box, your mind with the music, and you have the materialistic hypothesis. So, how, notice now that these two hypotheses are mutually inconsistent. They cannot both be true. Either you have a soul, you don't have a soul. Can't have it both ways. So, which one is more likely to be correct? That's what we want to find out. Uh, and how can we decide? Well, it's not hard in the abstract to decide. Again, we know, we have known for hundreds of years how to evaluate scientific hypotheses. It's the same way conceptually that we decide whether the Earth is flat or round. We interrogate the world, we look at the evidence, and when it comes back, as we know today, the Earth is, well, where I come from, there are many people who, you know, believe that, but we can put those aside, okay, the Earth is round-ish, okay? Um, yeah, that's sad. Maybe I should move to Canada. Uh, so when we do this, we find that um, all the evidence converges towards the materialistic hypothesis. This is what philosophers of science call consilience of evidence. This is why we believe in evolution, because there's overwhelming evidence coming from all these sources. This is why we believe in climate change. This is why we believe that tobacco causes cancer, and so on and so forth. And when we look at the soul, we see that all the evidence points away from the soul. I want to list now for you the, the lines of reasoning without going into each of them, but we can do that during the Q&A, that pushes us away from dualism. The first is that the soul has shrunk as scientific understanding has progressed. The second is that there is no formalism that describes the uh, operation of the soul. This is really important. Again, we can talk about this uh, a bit later. The third is that there's no objective empirical evidence that we have souls, but there could be. That's crucial, as I showed you earlier. 
uh, souls also fly in the face of uh, everything we know about modern science. Biology, physics, neuroscience, cognitive science. There's no expansory gain that we get from postulating the soul. So suppose that we say, as is true, we don't understand consciousness. Now suppose I say to you, the soul does it. Do you understand consciousness any better? Of course not. And finally, there's overwhelming evidence that supports the alternative, the materialistic hypothesis. And so the soul, therefore, that we've been talking about has exactly the set of properties that it should have if it didn't exist. And that's why modern science has overwhelmingly abandoned the idea of the soul. I want to show you how one of uh, the scientists puts it. This is Sean Carroll, who wrote uh, a piece uh, in uh, a blog for Scientific American called Physics and the Immortality of the Soul. He said, this is what uh, Sean writes. He writes that the choice you're faced with becomes clear. Either overthrow everything we think we have learned about modern physics, or distrust the stew of religious accounts, unreliable testimony, wishful thinking that makes people believe in the possibility of life after death. It's not a difficult decision as scientific theory choice goes. He goes on to add that there is no reason to be agnostic about ideas that are dramatically incompatible with everything we know about modern science. Now, when I give presentations like this one to general audiences and suggest that most scientists don't believe in the soul anymore and give reasons for that, a common reaction is something like this. It frightens people. But it shouldn't, really. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have this conversation uh, a bit later this evening. But I want to leave you with, <laughs> I, I usually show a clip, but I show you just a still here. One way that I think about this is, this is a, what happened in the movie Back to the Future, where the main character plays hard rock from the 1980s back in 1960, and it frightens everybody. And he ends up saying, well, you may not be ready for this yet, but, but your kids will love it. So I pretty much want to say the same thing about the soul. So thank you very much. I'm in the uncomfortable position of agreeing with more of what Michael said than what Julian said. And it's a little uncomfortable because uh, my background is in physics and I'm a theoretical physicist by training. Um, but I think it's reflective of an important point, that these things that we're talking about are extremely complicated and uh, nuanced. And I hope to share with you a little bit uh, some of my consternation and lack of understanding of these things. And I have to say, when Steve first asked me to, to do this, um, my first reaction was uh, uh, incredible joy because he was asking me to talk about things like what is consciousness and what are souls and can machines have them and are we biological machines or something else? What does this mean for ethics, et cetera, et cetera. There was a long list, maybe about 12 different things. And I looked at that list and I said, this is exactly what every human should be thinking about because they touch on every aspect of the human condition. But that joy was quickly replaced with dread and despair because what I do in my day-to-day -day job is something very close to this, but I realize that I don't have any inkling how to answer any of those questions. So um, I was put in a little bit of a quandary because I wanted to do a good job on this and say something new about all of these questions. And I tried. And what I found was that everything I could come up with which sounded definitive this is something that you should believe because it's clearly true. I couldn't find one single thing in any of this that was in that category. So what I decided to do instead was to tell you, not give you answers to all of these questions, but instead tell you some things that flavor the way I think about these problems. So I'm going to tell you about my thought process. Uh, and maybe here and there I'll say some specific things about what this means. Uh, before I do that though, just as a little bit of background to where, to sort of understand where I'm coming from. Um, 
I've been a technology developer all my life. So what I've done in my entire professional life since I left school is build things. Uh, I'm addicted to building things. And the kinds of things I like to build are things that don't exist. So the things that I, I, I uh, really get turned on thinking about are wild things not incompatible with science or the possibility that they could be built, but are so strange and interesting that they, you feel like devoting your life to building something like this could matter. So the first thing I did was try to build a machine called a quantum computer. Um, an out, spin, spin out, I suppose, of my research when I was in grad school. Uh, quantum computer is a computer that uses quantum mechanics, the fundamental language of nature, at least some think, uh, to compute. So I did that for about 15 years. But I had an epiphany somewhere along that, uh, that trajectory that computers are just machines that answer questions. And the more important thing was, who's asking the questions? And computers, at least as they're currently constituted, don't ask questions. So I decided that what I wanted to do instead was try to figure out, could you build a machine like an animal? So all biological animals share certain properties. Can you build a machine like that? And so I built a machine that was a little bit like an animal. This was my second company that used something called reinforcement learning uh, in the process of making robots move. But that wasn't really what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was build people. So what I've been doing now uh, for the last couple years is trying to understand what makes us human. And not in some theoretical sense, but practically. If I want to build a human, what do I need to know? What properties does this technological artifact have to have to count as a person? Okay, so I've got three things that I want to go through. Again, these are, to call them flavors or colors of thought. There are things that I believe are probably true that ground our thinking, make us clear about certain things that are probably correct. So the first one, uh, I want you uh, to think about family trees. This is the family tree of the uh, royal family in England, at least a part of it. You see at the bottom, there's these six children. And if you trace back their ancestry through their parents, you ultimately come up to uh, Queen Elizabeth II and Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. And those two individuals have an, an interesting and unique property in this family tree, is that they're what's called the most recent common ancestor of all those six kids at the bottom. And all that means is that every single one of those six children has a great-grandmother named Queen Elizabeth II. They share a common ancestor. All right? Good? Because this is going to go from really obvious to really not obvious very quick. Okay, so what I want you to do now, it's audience participation time, is if you're on this side, I want you to look two seats over and look at the person. And if you're on this side, I want you to look two seats over and look at that person. I want you to ask yourself, are you related to them? And what I mean by that is, is there a Queen Elizabeth somewhere in your family trees that you share? So a great, 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 great grandmother that maybe you, you share. Now, how, how many of you think that if you go back far enough, there is such a person? Show of hands. Okay. So uh, what science says is that not only is that true, not only are Steve and I related, maybe 11th cousins, who knows, but even more amazing that if you go back far enough, there's a single individual, a single person, or maybe pair, that's unlikely, but it could be, but one person who is the most recent common ancestor of every single human on the planet. So what that means, if it's true, is that we're all related. Every human on the planet shares a lineage from one single individual, which is mind-blowing. And it could be as early as the time of Alexander the Great, about 300 BC, which is shocking. How could it be so early? But some of the models say that it could be that early. But if it isn't, it doesn't matter. You just keep going back and eventually you, you'll find them. Okay, that's pretty cool because it means we're all kin. We're all related. All right, now let's take it one step further. 
How many of you, okay, I'm not going to ask that, but all of you who have a dog or a cat at home, I want you to like picture your dog or your cat, your specific dog or cat. All right? Turns out that my cat Fluffy and I have a common ancestor. If you go back far enough, my great, 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 maybe 70 million greats grand ancestor is shared between me and my cat. And in fact, it seems pretty clear that all placental mammals, all ma mammals who have a placenta, are all related. And it's probably true that it was a little animal that lived in the trees and ate bugs. And again, this isn't a species thing. It's an individual, which is really mind-blowing. One little guy, one of those little insect-eating guys, is a common ancestor of every single placental mammal that's currently on the Earth. So, we are all kin. And, by the way, keep doing this. All living things on the planet share common ancestry. We're all related. One large stream through time of forking and branching and dying and forking and branching and dying to where we are today. All right? Okay. Now, that's something we share, which is really important because I think all these a lot of questions that we want to ask about ourselves we need to ground in the fact that we're not different, not so different than a banana. Because if you go back long enough, that banana and you have a common ancestor. Uh, but of course, we're not exactly the same as all other animals. No animal is. And one way you can think about different species is that all species have something special. So, if you think about this little bird, again, I don't mean the category of bird, I mean that particular bird. That particular bird has an unbroken chain of successful reproduction going back all the way to the beginning of life on Earth. Its mom had a mom, its mom had a mom, its mom had a mom for a billion years, give or take. So that little bird is an amazing thing. It somehow managed through all those millions of years, billions of years, to get to the point of uh, still being around now. So this little guy, well, he can, he's a memory that seems to outstrip the size of his little brain. He can bury up to 5,000 caches of nuts in the summer. The snow falls on top, you can find them all. And also you can fly, which we can't do. So what about us? So we've got, uh, we've got a bunch of things that make us different. But the main one that we probably all agree is the one we need to focus on is what happens inside our heads. So we have this uh, amazing thing that we do where the world outside of us is very big. This room, say, is much bigger than my head. But somehow, in some real sense, I have the room inside my head. And it's not just the room, it's the city. And it's not just the city, it's the country. It's not just the country, I can think of the whole planet. In fact, I can think on the scale of solar systems or maybe even galaxies. And all that, all that stuff, not just at one instant of time, but maybe over a period of decades, I can think about. So how, can, how is this possible? And what I want to point out is the size. So my head's small. Well, not too small. It's small. Small compared to all that. How is it possible that all that's in here? And uh, what's come to be understood in the cutting edge of modern AI is that there is a really interesting, fascinating answer to this. And it has to do with the fact that the world has, has patterns, structure. So you may be familiar with fractals. So fractals look very complicated, but they're generated by a tiny little thing that you can write down in a few, a few numbers. And the world is like this. Images, like natural images, like what I'm looking at, have so much structure that they can be shrunk and compressed into a very tiny, what AI people call representation. So what our brains seem to do is build a very, very good compressed representation of the world, call it a model. 
So just like if I have a building and there's like a blueprint or a scale model of the building, imagine I have the whole world and all of its concepts and I shrink it down into this weird compressed representation so that it fits inside my brain. So the, the, the modern view of intelligence, or, a, or call it cognition more generally, is that it's a very important thing that we create models of the world inside our heads and everything you think, everything, from your feeling of self to the feeling that you may have a soul or a, or a maker, to your preference for cilantro or not, all of those things live inside a place which is dark and small and never sees the outside world. When we look through our eyes, there are photons hitting the outside of our face. They don't actually make it into the part that thinks. The part that thinks is looking at something else. It's looking at some kind of weird compressed signal. And this is really, really, really important because something that uh, Michael said, which is true, that the main thing that distinguishes us from all the other animals is not really language per se, because other animals make sounds with their mouth parts and communicate, like birds, cats, they do that. But something else is that we have the ability to model the world so well that we can develop abstract concepts concepts that are not specific things. So if I were to say, hey, uh, Bob, there's a lion behind that rock over there. That's a concrete thing. And Bob can be like, okay, I won't go over there. But if I say, uh, hey, Bob, there's a, a nation called the, the uh, make up a name, some country over there, and everybody who belongs to that country, they're all gonna kill you if you go over there. That's different. Because now you're not talking about a specific lion and a specific rock, you're talking about an imaginary thing, which is a nation. Nations are myths, they don't exist. They're shared delusions. They live at this level of abstraction above the concrete. If I ask you to hold a nation in your hand, you can't, because there is no such thing as a nation. A nation is a, a myth that we hold. And this quote is a little bit disturbing. I put it up there because, uh, it illustrates a point, but Harari is way too hard on this idea in the way that he describes it. Because not, just because something is an abstract concept, call it a myth, a thing that doesn't have tangible existence in the world, that does not mean it's not important, and it doesn't mean that it's not real. So let's take the, uh, the, the, uh, the soul. Okay, I will give that the soul as it's currently constituted, may not actually be a thing. But, but, this is where the complexity happens. We have an idea, we have a concept, an abstract thing that we can talk about as a group and understand as a shared collective of this thing. That is real, but it's real in a very strange sense. It's real in the sense that they are patterns in our brains. So these, this, this, this thing that our brain does can create these patterns, all right? Now that's not nearly enough to make it what we might want to think of as real, but let's get to the third part, technology, okay? So humans build things. And the best uh, description that I've ever read of what humans do when they build technology was written by this guy Kevin Kelly in this article. You can find it online. I highly recommend everyone read it if you want to understand at least how I think about technology. The technium is this idea that it's the sum total of all of the things that humans have ever built. So all of our stuff. For example, this, this room would count as part of the technium. And obviously things like cell phones and cars and computers would count also. Uh, now as humanity evolved from that furry, bug-eating dude all the way up through your shared common ancestor into where we are today, over time we've added to this thing called the technium and humans are peculiar in that we are not separate from the things that we build. 
And those things that we build come from the abstract concepts that we share. So when you build a piece of stuff today, you never do it by yourself. You do it with others, in a company, as a team, and those, that thing needs to be defined. And when you build something new, it doesn't exist, like the soul. When we first started D-Wave, there were no quantum computers, like the soul. They didn't exist, but there was an understanding that was shared amongst a whole bunch of people about what the world could look like if we built this thing that we all shared. All right? Now, the question about uh, AI and where all this, what, what this means for us in the future. So I take it as almost certain that someday we will build a machine, a category of machine, maybe something a little bit like what we're building at Sanctuary, maybe something that looks quite different. But that machine will be able to do everything every human could do way better than any human. So everything, not just some things, but all things. I take it for granted that that is a future that will come to pass because it seems like it's possible, enough people want to do it, there are all sorts of motivations, economic and otherwise, this will happen. But some people think that just because a thing is better than you at everything, it's a threat. But that's not true. And it's not true for a very specific technical reason in AI that when you build a machine, there are two things that are different. They're orthogonal. They don't interact with each other at all. One of them is the ability of the machine to do a job, but the other is its motivation. And motivation is something we don't usually ascribe to machines because most of the machines that we've built so far don't have it, at least not in a way that would be recognizable. You can kind of think of a toaster really wanting to make toast, but that's not really true. It's just a mechanism you push down makes toast. But let's say your, your children so your children are not like a toaster at all. Your children have motivations and desires and they want to do things that maybe you don't think are right. And increasingly, our technology will look like our children. They'll be reckless and not understand that if they put their hand on a burner, they're going to burn themselves and so on. So the quick question that I think that I've kind of come around to is that this question about what humans are is a really difficult one to answer. Uh, because it changes over time. It's not the same as it was 200 years ago, and in 200 years it'll be different. But I think what we really want to know, at least on the AI side, is what do we want our future to look like? So when we build the, our, our descendants, which is essentially what we do when we build machines, when we build our, our, our machine children, what do we want them to be like? That's the key question. And it's very, very difficult to know because any answer that you give is unsatisfactory in some way or another. And this is the one that I really struggle with. If you could build anything you wanted, what would it be? I, by the way, I could build, I think, a soul. Here's how I would do it. I copy you exactly into a digital environment. Everything about you. Imagine that was possible. It probably is. So if I copy you into a machine, that copy process has all of the properties we were talking about as, as being a soul. First of all, it's immaterial, because copying, that's not a thing, it's a process. It's immortal, it's just like you. You can put it in any environment you want, heaven, hell, make a simulation. So. Uh, all of these things that reside in our heads, these abstract concepts, I think that eventually we can build them and we have to decide what we want to build, which is the really hard question. Uh, yeah, and Kevin uh, ends this with, with this statement, is that think of our technology like a teenager leaving the home. Right now, he's living with us and sometimes we don't like him very much, but eventually he's going to leave and we better make sure that we've taught him the right things because he's not going to listen to us shortly. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Let's start discussing among the three of you. I'd, I'd love to, uh, I think we should start with the idea of the soul. And I wondered, um, Julian, if you could begin and then uh, Jordi and Michael could interact. Um, I think I'm speaking for many of us when I'd love for you to dip into the comforting part of us sure. not having a soul. Yep. If you could share a little bit of that and then I'll ask you guys to interact. So. 
the comforting part, I think, one way to think about this is to think about the difference between uh, facts and explanations. So here's an analogy that I use often. Uh, suppose that I were to, to grab this glass and hold it and release it from my hand. It would drop to the ground unless it's attached to the ceiling or something like that, right? Michael could do it. Jordy could do it. You could do it. If the word fact has any meaning at all in the English language, it's a fact that release glasses drop to the ground, okay? Now the question is, okay, how do we explain this fact? And the answer here is that that has changed over time. So Aristotle had an account, which was teleological. It's a big word, but it means that it was sort of goal-directed, right? The glasses and things like that want to find their natural resting place, okay. All right. And it was the account for a long, long time. In the 17th century, Isaac Newton develops the law of gravitation, says, look, it's just a goalless force of gravity that I can quantify mathematically that accounts for glasses falling, planets moving the way they, they do, and, and the tides doing what they do. In the beginning of the 20th century, Albert Einstein developed the theory of relativity, and now if you talk to physicists, they'll tell you, well, that gravity is, has to do with the curvature of space-time, for example. So notice that what happens is that the facts don't change. Right? A released glass or a released apple fell to the ground at the time of Aristotle, at the time of Newton, at the time of Einstein, but it's the explanation that has changed. So transpose the analogy to human beings now. What's are there facts about people? There are. So if you take uh, a, a normal, healthy adult, right, we have a very complex mental life. There's a range of things we can experience and feel. We can fall in love, we can be jealous, we can be happy to discuss ideas, right? Um, and uh, we have flexible behavior, right? We can respond to threats and praise, etc. That's a fact about human beings. Now, the question is, how do we explain these, th this fact? The answer used to be we had no idea, <laughs> because we had no idea about psychology uh, and cognitive science thousands of years ago. And so we said, look, the soul does it. What's changed now is not the facts, but the explanation. Now we say, look, it's the brain that does it. It's some kind of computation in your brain, right? Um, so in a way, nothing changes. It's not simply because scientists say, look, we probably don't have a soul that you guys are going to stop being able to fall in love tomorrow. You, you won't. We just explain why you fall in love differently. We explain why you feel this way or do that thing differently. So that's the thing that I think is comforting. Um, but I would add two things now, and then I will you know, let other people jump in. Of course, so in a sense, nothing changes, right? Because all we do is change the explanation. But there's a sense in which everything changes. Because the soul, in addition to being responsible for our mundane properties, also gave us immortality. Okay? And if you remove the soul, you remove a mechanism for immortality. Now, I really like what Jordi was saying earlier, because I think that naturally we're mortal. Right? But that doesn't mean that we won't be able one day to come up with technology to become immortal. The analogy here is that, say, naturally we can't breathe underwater. I mean, you can try this in your bathtub tonight, it's not going to work very well. But we've developed technology to breathe underwater, scuba diving equipment, for example. Naturally, we can't fly. Don't jump off the roof of your building, but we can't fly. But we've developed aircraft, airplanes, helicopters. There's nothing in the laws of physics that says that one day, just like what Jordi was saying, we won't be able to become immortal, right? So if you care about immortality, it might suck for you right now until we develop technology. Okay, we're mortal, most likely. But one day, we may become immortal. So that's one potential issue. And then the other thing is that the soul and the soul narrative gives us a particular notion of free will. But I don't want to go into this because it's, we can if we want to, but I really want to let other people speak, so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, yep. thank you. Do you want to? Sure, so I, I guess I'd put it this way, you know, what do, what, do, what, what do we lose if we lose the concept of the soul? And so imagine God descends from heaven onto the stage and says, folks, let me settle the question. There's no such thing as a soul. See you later. Um, uh, now, you might say, well, w w w wait a minute. Uh, Michael Murray said that if we don't have a soul, we don't have understanding. And uh, it's too late. God's gone at that point. But 
that wouldn't change your view of whether or not you have understanding. You'd just say, well, I guess Michael Murray's argument was wrong, right? I mean, he said you couldn't have understanding unless we had a soul. We don't have a soul. That was wrong. So, um, I mean, this is just reinforcing the same point, right? If it turns out that this um, metaphysical entity doesn't in fact exist, maybe it doesn't change anything. It just changed the, changes the mode of explanation. Now we're not explaining it in terms of the existence of some kind of immaterial reality. We're explaining it in terms of the operation of some kind of purely physical reality. But, uh, just here are a couple of other things to think about. So first of all, um, you know, maybe you lose the notion of immortality and maybe not. Uh, maybe you lose the, don't lose the notion of immortality because um, computer scientists are going to develop a mechanism for replicating everything that's essential about you in an inorganic machine that can go on forever. I'm pretty skeptical about that for conceptual reasons that we can talk about later. But even if you don't buy that, right, maybe you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim who believes in resurrection. So you don't need Jordy. Uh, God can take care of that another way, right, by resurrecting you in the future and bringing you back fully with a body. And some of you may know in uh, recent theological scholarship, there are a number of theologians who've been arguing that, in fact, that's the reading uh, that we ought to take from the... From the um, uh, sacred texts that we are embodied and there is no such thing as an immaterial soul so maybe you don't lose anything there um, but maybe in other places you do so you gesture to free will at the end and so even if you know God were to come down and say there's no soul and then disappear you might wonder whether or not we really have free will right you might think Mm, that was an illusion. So we thought that it was um, that we merited praise and blame for our good and bad deeds, and we thought that our practices of of holding people accountable for the things that they did, good or bad, made sense. You might conclude that that doesn't make sense anymore, and perhaps that's the way it is. But it would significantly change how we understand understand ourselves and our relationships with one another. Now, that alone isn't a good reason to resist the, the scientific evidence, but it's a bit of a reason. And I say that because, at least the way arguments work in the domain of philosophy, and I think it's a perfectly sensible way for arguments to work, is we begin with our common sense understanding of the world, and we think it's reasonable for us to affirm that common sense understanding of the world until we have a sufficiently strong reason to surrender it. And the notion that we have free will and that we are morally responsible agents is very very deeply rooted in how you think about yourself and how you think about all the people around you. So if it turns out that God drops down and says, yep, no soul, um, well, I think you ought to give up the idea. But at this point, I think the, um, the evidence isn't uh, sufficiently strong that we should surrender it um, without resolving certain puzzles, the puzzles of the sort that I mentioned. Well, I don't think we have free will um, and I, I believe uh, well, belief is a weird word here, but uh, there are strong arguments coming from the physical sciences that seem irrefutable that we don't actually have this property we think we have. But this is another one of these really subtle twists. If you're a society that believes that you have free will, you will quite clearly do better than one that doesn't. Because if you believe you have free will, you'll have rule of law, you'll have punishment fitting the crime, you'll have accountability in the social circles that you're in. All of these things are necessary. So it makes sense to me that even though on the physical level, like I mean by you know, deep physics, uh, we don't actually make the decisions that we think we do. We need the illusion of it. And this is one of these myths that holds society together. We, we need the myth. So I, I think that the, you know, this is one of these areas where this is a very difficult thing to discuss because uh, it's hard to know how to parse people's arguments. Because often people will say things that all sound the same, but they're somehow fun, like they're, they come from the same thing from a different perspective. And all of us have thought about this for a long time. And you know, I do have sympathy for the other views and they might be true, but I just wanted to share that I, that's my perspective is I don't think we actually do um, coming from the physics side. Um, the idea of the soul being something that can be scientifically proven, I think is an, a new thought for many of us. I wondered if you could interact on that a little bit. Like, is, is that what you believe, Michael, that we can use science to? 
Well, I, I think there it's, it's correct to say that in part the, um, the soul is a scientific hypothesis. And if you look at the way the soul has been treated throughout the history of reflection on the nature of mind, in some sense it's been treated like a scientific hypothesis. So even before the scientific revolution, you have thinkers like Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas who, again, using science and empirical data as they understood it in their day, thought that appealing to this non-physical component of the human person was the only way to explain this phenomenon that they thought they could observe, either observing it in other people or just observing it through introspection. So there's a sense in which they treated it as a scientific hypothesis. Um, and as Julian pointed out, there are at least in principle ways that you could empirically test whether or not um, we have um, something that's like an immaterial soul. So looking at near-death experiences, um, you know, he mentioned that so far we don't have any evidence that people can um, have experiences outside of their physical body. Interestingly, I think we were talking about this the other day, um, there's a study underway currently, um, you can look this up if you get bored, um, this, uh, an, uh, an ER doc at NYU, New York University, is you know, doing a study across a number of different hospitals in the US um, on this very topic right now. So when people go into cardiac arrest, believe it or not, uh, I wouldn't want to go into cardiac arrest in one of these hospitals, but they uh, rush in, they put an EEG helmet on you, they measure your vital signs, they actually put headphones on you because um, they play a sequence of music so they can uh, measure the, the, the time intervals at which people are reporting any conscious experiences. And then they have iPads up pointing up at the ceiling with different symbols on them. And when people come uh, back from their near-death experience, they interview them to see if, in fact, they have sensory perceptions of these things that they couldn't see from their physical body. So if they do see something, does that prove that there's a soul? Eh, I mean, I don't, it doesn't actually prove it. Because there are ways you could explain this, right, physically, but, um, but it gives you some reason to believe. So I think that um, sort of thing might provide some empirical evidence. But for me, it's still the case that some of these conceptual worries are, are real. And I know that they sound like tricks, right? I mean, look, I've taught enough philosophy classes to know that when you hear these conceptual arguments, it sounds like it's just some philosopher trick and we should ignore that, and a lot of scientists do, frankly. But, um, but interestingly, we don't have solutions to them. And so I, I was mentioning to these guys yesterday, if you look at polls, not that we should decide these things on the basis of majority vote, but when you look at polls amongst professional philosophers and you ask them, um, do you lean in the direction of physicalism, the claim that human beings are purely physical, or against physicalism? 24% lean against physicalism. And the reason they lean against it is because they're genuinely worried about these, these uh, conceptual arguments. They don't know how to solve them. And I give you two, but there are many, many of them. And um, so anyway, I think until we get that settled, whether those are scientific arguments or not, I mean, it depends on your definition of science. But they're legitimate intellectual arguments that we need to think about. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I, I really agree. So they are, they are these, uh, these arguments. So maybe we, I can get back to the, the question of free will. So I, well, let me first say, whenever we have a discussion of free will, it's, I think it's a good idea to say what we mean by free will. Right? So there is a kind of free will, like, like Jordi, I don't believe in. And it's usually what's called in the literature uh, libertarian or contra-causal free will. It's the idea that human beings are uh, uncaused causes. So, if someone believed in this kind of free will and you were to ask them, okay, what, what caused you to pick up this glass to have a sip of water? They would say, my will did. I willed my arm to pick up my glass of water. And now if you ask them, okay, what caused your will to do it? They'd say, nothing. My will is free. For the same reasons that Jordi doesn't believe in this, I think it really flies in the face of everything we know about modern science. Okay. And, but I agree with Michael that once you sort of say, okay, I'll, I'll go with the science side. There's all kinds of problems that arise, okay? So now you say, great. If indeed we don't have this kind of free will, of free will, then we have to think about the question of moral responsibility. I think in the end, we get with something much better. I just want to give you an example. So I think that this kind of free will, right, contra-causal libertarian free will, is highly suspect scientifically. And even if it weren't, I wouldn't want us to have that kind of free will. But here's why. Suppose that I invite you over to my mansion, where you can all fit there, right? And we have drinks, and we talk about free will. And at some point, I, I have a martini, and I, I'm chatting with one of you, the, the gentleman holding the screen there, for example, and we're chatting about free will. At some point, I, I throw my martini in your face. <laughs> and you say, 
Julian, why the hell do you do that? You, the first thing you'd be looking for is a reason, a cause. Why caused me to do what I did? Is it something you said? Is it that I'm from France, that the French like to shower their guests with olives and vodka? What if I said to you, look, no, it has nothing to do with anything. It's a pure act of free will. You think I'm insane, not free. Okay? And so I don't think we want that kind of free will. And luckily enough, science tells us we don't have it. I think forcefully. Then we have to do what Michael does. We said, great. Now let's think through what I think he's absolutely right. This has massive consequences for our legal system. And I, I don't want to go on. I could, but I think I'm happy to discuss. And I think they're very positive ones. And there are implications that were recognized already by people like Darwin and, uh, and the materialists of the 18th century, like La Maitrie, for example, uh, who wrote a very nice little uh, book called L'homme machine in uh, 1747, I believe, was published, which means man is a machine, as a machine. He said Descartes was wrong, we don't have souls. And then the very bottom of the table of contents, there's something that, that says the moral advantages of La Maitrie's view of man. And I really think that there are moral advantages to this view of, uh, of, well, of causation, of human agency that doesn't take into account this notion of free will. But I don't want to get too far ahead. So that's free will. In, you know, took people 2,000 years, I give it to you yeah, in two minutes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so okay. you might not be surprised to learn that there are ph philosophical advocates for the notion of libertarian free will that would not buy that characterization of it. And um, so to say that, it, that uh, free will is an, is an uncaused action or something like that, and therefore an action that happens spontaneous like this with throwing the drink in someone's face uh, without any reason at all would be ex um, an example uh, of what a free will action is doesn't actually map onto what libertarians themselves actually say. They just say that the conditions that obtain aren't causally sufficient for the act to occur. That doesn't mean there aren't any precursors to those actions. So for most libertarians, action has to be motivated by a set of beliefs and desires that you have. You have to believe that there's something that you can accomplish by carrying out a particular action and you have to have a desire to do it. It's just that those beliefs and desires all on their own aren't efficacious. So the range of things that are eligible for you to do are the range of things where you have beliefs about the doing of them and you have the desires to do them. And then what's up to the agent is which of those desires and beliefs to make efficacious for action. And that making those things efficacious for action is something that's underdetermined by the physical laws. That's, that's the view that most libertarians hold. But um, the other thing I'll say is, and we don't, uh, I'll just say this, but there's n absolutely no way we can adjudicate this in the course of this conversation. So um, what you heard Jordi and um, Julian saying is that the scientific consensus or the scientific evidence is pretty clear that we don't have free will. And most people, most scientists of the mind who say that are thinking about a set of experiments done by, very famous experiments done by this neuroscientist Benjamin Labette. Uh, we won't go into the, you may know these experiments, I won't go into the details of them. But in the last five years, there has been a serious concerted effort to go back and take a look at these Libet experiments to see if in fact they showed what Libet claims. And there is a high degree of skepticism. And part of the reason, there was actually a Nature article published about five years ago, full page um, uh, introduction to the article saying, neuroscientists say we don't have free will, but ph some philosophers are saying that we need to think otherwise. And part of the reason for that was because there are conceptual issues in the way those experiments were designed, conceptually sloppy elements that just don't map the notion of free will that Labet was looking at to the way at least philosophers think about the notion. So there's still some reconciling that needs to go on in thinking about this emp the empirical data and what it really shows. It, you shouldn't take that on my authority, but I, I'm just, all I'm pointing out to you is that if you look into the recent literature, you'll see that there have been challenges raised to those Libet experiments. And so again, I don't know what the right answer is, but I don't think anybody else does either at this point. Jordy, I don't know if you've Googled yourself lately, um, <laughs> but there are, uh, I discovered quite a, well, several religious bloggers who are um, alarmed at the work you're doing. And I wondered if you thought that religion had something to offer technology in a good way besides just sort of harsh critique or fear. Uh, yes, okay. 
<laughs> so first of all, I would take issue with the, the religious bloggers thing. I don't actually think they're religious bloggers. I think they're wing nuts. <laughs> that's, that's they're, they're, uh, they're people like that uh, InfoWars guy. Yeah. Um, they're not serious people. But so my, my position on the intersection of religion and science is actually very pro-religion in a very maybe strange way. And that I, um, I never discount any serious person's idea ever, no matter what it is. I have good friends who believe they commune with the dead. I don't make fun of them. I take them seriously. I listen to what they say. Uh, I have good friends who um, are deeply religious. And that's fine. Uh, many of my good friends are Buddhists. Identify a lot with some of those things. You know, the thing I, I think, thing I keep coming back to is this, say that going back to this issue of the soul, I think that anything we can think of in our heads we may be able to build. So this is a very profound thing because um, what it means is that the future um, can be designed to look any way you like. So let's say you have profound religious beliefs of a certain kind. You believe in the soul, you believe in an all-powerful deity, you can believe in all sorts of different things. As long as those things aren't incompatible with some fundamental rules that the universe has, eventually we can build them, and then they will for sure be real. So if you take the, uh, the idea of the soul, yeah, maybe, maybe we don't have them in the obvious sense today, but we have an idea of them, and those ideas can become tangible and concrete through the actions of people. So I, I, uh, I hesitate to take any harsh, sharp positions on any of these things because they're very complicated and they they go back to this thing that we are we're, we're we have agency we we act and by acting we change the constituency of the world around us and we act based on ideas that aren't in the world explicitly all of the great cathedrals of europe were built because groups of people believed in some abstract concept. Those cathedrals are real, they're still there. Nobody's gonna argue with the fact that there's a cathedral in Seville, it's there. So I think that at some point, we'll be able to build the conception of the God that people who built that cathedral believed in. Now, will we choose to do so? I don't know. I think that's the great challenge that faces us as a, as, a, as an advanced technological society about to become something very different than what we used to be. We're about to have technological and scientific abilities that transcend the sorts of things that we have today. And how are we gonna use them? Are we gonna build weapons that kill life? Are we gonna ruin our planet? Or are we going to look to the angels of our better nature and try to build things that are generally viewed as being positive things. I think that's the key question. And I think it goes to this, what does it mean to be human? I think we are about to go through a great filter where our metal will be tested, which is a very old religious idea, that we will be judged. We're not going to be judged by some abstract entity. We're going to be judged by our fitness to survive. And the decisions we make and what we do and what we build are going to be the grist for that mill. If we decide to be evil, we will build technologies that will unravel everything that we've built. If we decide to be good, we will build technologies that will allow us to flourish and go to the stars and spread everything that's good about us all over the place. So I feel very strongly that everybody in this room has a duty to have a voice because the most powerful thing that we have as humans are ideas. And ideas are easy to spread. You just write them on the internet and millions of people can see them. And so when you write something on your Twitter feed or your Facebook page, remember that that idea matters. If you want somebody to clean up the oceans, say, hey, how about uh, somebody go clean up the oceans? And if enough people start saying that, it becomes a thing. It becomes a concrete proposition. And then people will start trying. And it all starts with having these ideas. Michael, what's your view on what religion has to say about what the future, as Jordi has presented it, looks like? 
Well, religion's a big thing. Uh, and, you know, there are, are many religious and faith traditions, and, and to some extent they have competing visions of what human flourishing looks like individually and communally. Um, so I think the question, you know, one question we need to ask ourselves is, do, does one or the other of them present a conception of human flourishing with which we resonate and that can provide us with some guidance in terms of how we deploy these um, technologies going forward? And, um, you know, uh, we all know that, the, uh, that CRISPR has really been in the news in the last couple of weeks, and it's raised the specter of our using um, technology to uh, produce germline modifications that can alter our offspring in extremely radical ways. Rays ways that are so radical you probably haven't imagined it yet. And, um, and then the question is, well, what ought we to do? Like, what is it permissible to do? And what's conducive to our flourishing? And what's immoral when it comes to these things? And those are the questions that aren't being asked urgently enough. I've had the privilege of being part of a number of conversations with people who have uh, been developing this technology. And frankly, it's frightening how they don't think about that question. Now, you don't necessarily need religion to um, encourage you to think about moral questions. Uh, you don't even need religion, perhaps, to provide you with an overarching moral framework within which to think about these questions. But religious traditions have long experience with constructing these architectures for thinking about complex moral questions. And I think that um, they, they do indeed have something to, to offer. So within the Christian tradition, at least amongst those who endorse the notion of natural law, I'm not saying you ought to or that you do, but if you were to do that, um, that conception provides an understanding of, of human nature and human purpose and human flourishing that provides us with a sense of guardrails for what we ought and ought not do. Now, unfortunately, it's very unlikely that any state is going to adopt those measures into law and use those measures as tools for limiting what scientists are going to do with this technology. And frankly, even if they do, it's probably not going to stop people from doing it anyway. But um, it's urgent that we begin to reflect on these questions and ask, are there things that we should be borrowing from these traditions? Are these fruitful and fertile ways of thinking about good and evil, morality, immorality, flourishing and, um, and harm that we can put into place as we uh, chart our course into the future? With all this uh, free time we might have as humans, um, with machines that are able to be better at us than everything, I know what, right now with my free time, I spend a lot of time watching Netflix and uh, <laughs> achieving nothing. And I'm wondering, um, how do you imagine, Jordi, and then how does this connect with us being distinctly human, how we will be able to flourish as humans you know, in good ways when machines are doing, I guess, the work that we would normally do? Well, um, not so long ago, uh, we had uh, chamber pots. And we, had to, um, we had to pee in a bucket and toss it out the window. Uh, not so long ago, uh, a couple hundred years ago. And uh, then we got uh, indoor plumbing, which was great. An indoor plumbing is a kind of machine that does a job that no human really wants to do. Uh, I view the future as being increasingly all of the things that need to happen to keep us uh, safe, uh, fed, clothed, sheltered, lit, entertained, all that stuff is going to be done by fully automatic systems. And by I mean fully automatic, I mean fully. For everything from when the sunlight strikes the solar cell to the, the factory that manufactures the solar cell, the robot that puts the solar cell where it collects the energy, all of it, the whole thing, there will be no humans involved in it at all. Entirely automated. Uh, the machines that fix those things will also be fully automated. Now this isn't gonna happen anytime soon, but I mean in the far future. So in that world, what you're doing is increasingly removing the drudgery from work. You're not removing work because I suspect that there are inherent drives in all humans that drive us to have, want to have meaning in our lives and we find meaning. So the equivalence between the sweat of your brow 
enriching someone else, which is what you do when you work, and the value of your life, those things aren't the same. So you enriching somebody who's your boss, which is essentially what you do when you work for a salary, um, is not the same as what your worth is. Those two things have become intertwined in the way that we think about work, and we have to break that relatively recent thing uh, into two parts. So in the future, I think increasingly all of the stuff that is essential for having a healthy, happy life is going to become free. The reason it's free is that there's no humans involved. Uh, the machines that are doing it will be designed to gain maximal joy from the jobs that they're doing. The little robot that installs the solar panels will have a motivation that wants nothing to do other than that. It may be super intelligent. It's all it wants to do. Um, there's this great science fiction story about a, a guy in the far future who has everything and all he wants to do is carve table legs. Uh, I think that, that, that in the future we're going to be free to do interesting things that really capture the, uh, the power of the human mind. So we want to explore. We're going to go all sorts of places around the universe. Um, we want to build. We want to create. We want to have community. We want to um, design things that don't exist. So none of those things go away, and we will create an economy. So imagine all that drudgery is all taken care of. We will create an economy up here, and it will be economy between humans for human-like things. You'll pay somebody for the art that they create, or you'll pay them for an experience, or you'll pay them for company. You'll pay them because you want them to be your friend. That sounds a little weird, but I think it's going to be the way it will be in the future. And this type of economy will make sure that we're all essentially always getting better as a, as a, as a group. Uh, and I don't think that this is going to be a bad thing. I think it's going to be one of the most wonderful things that's ever happened to human civilization. So, yeah, I want to echo what Jordi said. So one possible future, ideally, would be that uh, machines free us. I mean, we are inherently curious, creative creatures, uh, and uh, we could basically not have to do a lot of the things that, you know, we have to do now, but wouldn't really do otherwise, uh, and, and liberate this creative potential. That's one possible future, um, at the sort of the happy end of the spectrum. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we're not going to get there. We're basically going to self-destruct. Uh, and that there are people who think that this is a real possibility. I'm not saying I'm taking a position, I'm giving you a, a range, right? Um, so we're talking now about uh, possible applications and threats maybe of really intelligent machines. We're not quite there yet, but um, as I was sharing with uh, Michael and Jordi when we were having this discussion yesterday, what worries me now is the natural kind of intelligence, not the artificial yet. So there are threats that we face as a species right now. Uh, there are existential threats. And it's not people gathering at the southern border in the United States. That's not an existential threat, right? I'm talking about things like climate change or nuclear weapons. These are real threats. Um, and there are people who have thought about this and thought about um, the possibility of life on other planets and everything and have concluded that the moment a species uh, reaches human-grade intelligence, it's only a short time until they self-destruct. Okay, so that's the boundaries, right? Uh, we can self-destruct, potentially. In fact, we came very close a number of times. would be happy to share with you some stories. Uh, or we can be living in the world of bliss, like, you know, machines take care of everything, we don't have to work anymore, uh, there's peace uh, on Earth, and we can really, you know, uh, let our creative desires take over and do whatever we want. And there's all kinds of scenarios in between. I think I want to maybe wrap this up by sharing something with you that I, I shared with uh, Michael and, uh, and Jordi yesterday, which is what I think about as the, the, the paradox of reason. I'm, I'm working on a new book right now on human reason. So here's the, 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 the idea of, the, of this paradox of reason. On the one hand, it is human great intelligence that has allowed us for better or worse, probably for worse, to build nuclear weapons and to, no other species can do that, and to uh, unleash this uh, disaster called climate change. 
Okay, and that could do us in. So reason could very well do us in. It could be a lethal mutation in some sense, human great intelligence. On the other hand, the only way we have to avoid that is human reason. That's the only way. We can't just pray the problems away. We have to have those kinds of inclusive discussions and try to see uh, where good ideas come from and try to see how we could build good machines, how we could uh, solve the problem of climate change. And uh, nuclear weapons may not worry you too much. And, and, and if you sleep too well at night and you want a book that is going to make you sleep a little less well at night, uh, you should read a book by Daniel Ellsberg called The Doomsday Machine. That's going to scare the crap out of you. Um, and it's a worry, too. So the future is open. It's up to us, I think, right now to do what we want or can to make it, you know, heaven or hell. Futurists have done, generally done a pretty bad, bad job of predicting how things are going to go when new technologies are invented. And it's kind of a humorous thing to actually read back in, in history when new technologies were introduced and the, uh, the doom that was predicted to result from the invention of this technology and looking what actually happened. So when, the, when railroads were first invented, it was predicted that this was going to be the, the doom of, of, of human culture. And of course, well, we all outlived the trains. Most of us haven't ridden on a train in a very long time. Um, and so I, I suspect that whatever we predict is going to happen as a result of advances in artificial intelligence is going to prove to be wrong. But, I mean, I think as Jordy pointed out, we have good, good reason to be optimistic here um, that what one thing we know is that these machines will have the ability to take some of the drudgery out of our lives to do the things that you don't want to do. So, you know, we already have robots that can vacuum the house. I don't have one. I still have to vacuum myself, but I'm really looking forward to getting one, right? And uh, for many of the other sort of drudgery tasks that we do. But what it, what it won't take away from uh, are those things that, uh, with, uh, that we take the most pleasure in. So whether that's uh, painting or playing the trombone or canoeing the Brandywine River, um, unless the AI machine elbows you off the tennis court, you'll still be able to do those sorts of things. But, I mean, as, a, as the Christian philosopher, I think that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, our, our, my view is that our flourishing consists in these dual activities of stewarding the creation and engaging in relationships of love and friendship with God and one another. And I don't think, um, while artificially intelligent machines might help us to more effectively steward creation, it's part of our obligation to make sure that they do what they do in ways that are consistent with the values that we think are important. But, and none of that will take away from our ability to engage in relationships of love and friendship. So think about the relationships that you have with your parents or your children or your spouse. Um, no artificially intelligent machine is going to take that away from you unless they become more, more of attractive mate than you are, unless they're better at loving than you are, in which case, you know, you need to up your game. But um, my, my point is that nothing about that will take away from those things and the flourishing that we enjoy now uh, can, need only be enhanced by these developments. I'd like to ask about relationships, um, and again, getting back to what does it mean to be human distinctly. The um, empath things like empathy and compassion, you mentioned love, Michael, are they distinctly human traits, and if so, where do they come from? And I'm thinking, I think, particularly of empathy. Uh, the, the short answer is no, they're not uniquely human. Uh, even our morality, not the fully-fledged sense, but um, uh, notions of fairness, for example, you can find in the animal kingdom. So I want to share with you a very clever and, and cute and deep experiment that uh, a primatologist called Franz de Waal has done with capuchin monkeys uh, to test for the sense of fairness. So the, the way it works is you train the monkeys, they're in cages, side by side, they can see each other, and you train them to give you a token, and in exchange for that token, you, can, you give them a reward. It's either a piece of cucumber or a piece of grape. So let's say that the first monkey, you know, gives you a token, you give him a piece of cucumber, eats the cucumber, great. You do that to the second monkey, great. Okay. Now what you do is that um, when the first one gives you a token, you give that monkey a piece of grape, which they, they have a preference for grape over cucumber, by the way. And then when the second one who saw what happened uh, gets a piece of cucumber uh, when he or she gives you the token, 
they'll take the cucumber and throw it in your face. I'm not kidding. You should watch it on YouTube. There, but before he or she saw its friend get the grape, they would eat the cucumber 20 times in a row. Right? So it's experiments like that that, that suggest that uh, notions like fairness, for example, uh, are not uniquely human. Um, and so there, and there are many other, and I think that goes towards something that Michael was saying during his presentation, that the, the gap between humans and non-human animals, which seemed maybe a while back to be large, has really shrunk. Doesn't mean we're not unique, doesn't mean we don't have capacities that are uniquely human, but many things that we thought were uniquely human are not uniquely human. And that goes for things like empathy and, uh, I mean, you, you've seen this, if you have pets, you can tell that, uh, you know, they, uh, they're not just robots, they have feelings and emotions, clearly. Uh, I wanted to mention also that the, the organization that I'm with now, the very first thing that we did is we, we jointly uh, launched a thing at Science World, which is a, a local thing in Vancouver, you get about a million people through a year, called the Empathy Lab, where the main scientific question is, um, can humans and machines have empathy for each other? And if so, how does that work? So I actually think this question of empathy is the most important thing to think about when we're building uh, machines that interact with people. Can, they, can machines have empathy for people and can people have empathy for machines? And if not, why not? And if so, what does it look like? So did you figure that out? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing because humans have uh, superficial reactions and then they have deep reactions. So the superficial ones are rather um, easy to fake. Okay. So for example, if I, if I come up to you and I'm just outside of your personal space and I just have the biggest smile on my face, you're gonna smile, like almost always. Because we have an animal reaction um, to certain facial expressions and we react in certain ways. But that doesn't mean that you're happy and it doesn't mean that you necessarily like me it's just kind of an instinctual reaction that you have. So with a machine, it's very difficult to know how to deal with that deeper meaning, but at a superficial level, um, it's uh, fairly straightforward to both measure the state of mind in terms of emotional state and some related things as a machine and respond to it in a socially appropriate way, but it's still not exactly what you'd want to call empathy. It's sort of the beginnings of it. Thank you. So um, these are really complicated questions. I think with respect to empathy, there is really good evidence that you find empathy displayed in the non-human animal world. And there's some really interesting results. Um, I'll give you one example of this, of looking at grooming behavior amongst chimps. So there, um, uh, chimps that have dominant structures and uh, dominant males will sometimes um, abuse or kill uh, subordinate males within the community. And it happens in two different sorts of ways, or many sorts of ways. But in some cases, you get subordinate males who just are there minding their own business and the dominant male comes over and just clobbers somebody, uh, apparently for no good reason. Uh, there are other cases where you have troops where there are subordinates who just aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So they're getting in the face of the dominant male, they're making these aggressive displays, they're making gestures as if they want to mate with um, female members of the, of the troop that they have no business mating with, right? And in those cases, it eventually provokes the dominant male, so they come in and they clobber the subordinate who's doing what they're not supposed to do. What's really interesting is um, other members of the troop who see the subordinate get clobbered will come over generally and groom that subordinate afterwards. And you see the, am the, the amount and the length of time of grooming is significantly larger in the case where the subordinate got innocently clobbered by the dominant male. So it looks like there's something like empathy going on there. They're showing a lot of extra, providing a lot of extra attention to the one who didn't seem to deserve it. Um, fairness is a trickier matter, so the, the video that <laughs> Julian mentioned is really hilarious to watch. And, um, and it's been cited many, many times, but I think it's also been debunked. So uh, that experiment's been replicated in a situation where you don't have another capuchin that's receiving what looks like a better reward. It's just you have the bowl of um, grapes sitting there. And all you need is for that other um, uh, capuchin to see that there's a better reward out there to get the cucumber thrown back in their face. They could care less whether you're giving the better one to the other one that, uh, did, that did the same task. I think fairness is still a tricky one. Uh, I think the verdict's still out uh, on that. But um, 
Uh, oh, actually, there's one other thing I was going to say, but I can't remember what it is, okay. so I'll stop there. It'll come back. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to uh, try to end at 9.30. We're going a little over time because we began late, so we're uh, taking your questions now. And I will remind you that there is opportunity for those of us who are here in person uh, to interact with our speakers also at our reception that follows. So. Uh, the first question is for you, Michael. Is the soul necessary to the Christian worldview? If not, where do we go from here? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And there's lots of debate about this in theological circles. So um, I'll, I'll go back to this sort of poll that I mentioned earlier. Do you lean for or against? Uh, when I've got my theological hat on, I lean for the immaterial soul just because I think there are biblical narratives that are hard to square with the purely physicalist view. So Paul, for example, um, in Corinthians, um, remarks that uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, you know, if it turns out there is no such thing as an immaterial soul, Christians will have to find ways to explain away passages like that. Um, there's, a, there's a narrative in the Old Testament that involves a, a person who is dead uh, coming and addressing people who are alive. And it looks like this is not a physical instantiation of that individual. And so to make sense of narratives like that, it looks like you might have to invoke something like immaterial souls that are surviving the bodily death of this individual is uh, now coming back to um, uh, uh, talk to the living. Um, there are narratives from Revelation that look like they are um, referencing individuals who stand around the throne of God even prior to the so-called res future resurrection taking place. So they're, they're just things that seem to be indicative of something like a non-physical thing um, that persists after one's bodily death. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are theologians who've argued that there are ways of explaining those passages and then indeed the strong emphasis in the Christian scriptures on embodiment, on the importance of the body. I mean, what you don't find in the, in the Christian scriptures is uh, something like dualism of the Cartesian or Platonic sort explicitly taught. By no means, right? There's a very strong emphasis on the significance of the body. So these theologians say, look, even though there are these anomalous passages that might indicate something like an immaterial soul, the overwhelming weight of, ev of evidence is in favor of the idea that we are embodied beings. And if physicalism is the way we're embodied, we're, we're completely fine with that. Julian, if the soul is immaterial, non-physical, why should we be able to study it with physical means? Why should we be able to study it with yeah. physical means? Yeah. Simply because it has manifestations in the physical world it really, that are observable. It doesn't matter, you could call it anything you want. Take the supernatural, right? If the supernatural has manifestations in the natural world that we can measure, we can study it. It doesn't matter that it's material, immaterial, natural, supernatural. That's the simple answer, I think. Okay. If it had, on the other hand, if people claimed that there was a soul or a God that had no effect whatsoever in the world, then yeah, okay, we wouldn't be able to study anything like that. But precisely what people think is that the soul is uh, psychologically potent, so it has effects in the physical world, and we can study those effects. That's the answer. And if it had no effect in the world, it wouldn't then, seem to be very interesting. Yeah, it would not yeah. be very interesting right. in the first place, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jordi, will the machines that we build also want meaning? Will they philosophize? Oh, yeah, of course, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Will they create religion? Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, the, uh, the, the force that religion binds a, a social animals together, I think that machines will have other things that bind them together. I think it's, it's powerful to be bound together because you're, any is better than trying to do something difficult. I think I just lost my thing. Uh, actually, one interesting side note. So humans communicate via very low bandwidth uh, connections like books and speech, uh, internet. Uh, but machines don't. Um, the machines that we build are all connected in the sense that their daily thoughts or experiences are all pooled at the end of the day and become the, the fodder for the learning algorithm. So and then they, their minds are kind of pushed back out to them at the end of the day. So they, they do something that we don't do is that they explicitly share concepts um, through very high bandwidth connections. So this sounds a little technical, but it, it means that they could develop 
uh, even more potent forms of things like religion, which are abstract shared concepts about the world. And so, yeah, I think it's hard to know for sure, but I, I suspect that machines will have, at least in the short term, will have all of the properties that we have. Right. Julian, uh, do you agree that materialism rules out free will? If yes, how then are people morally responsible? I agree that modern science rules out, I think, or at least there's strong evidence that it rules out a particular kind of free will. Now, um, on the question of whether we should be held morally, or whether we have moral responsibility, right? Is that the idea? Yeah, yes. Um, I have a radical, kind of a radical view on this. I think that the notion of moral responsibility, we probably need uh, in general interactions to yes. put pressure on people. Exactly. Right? But in actual legal settings, I think we can simply do away with it. It's completely irrelevant. I think what we should care about in actual legal settings is, was the person causally responsible for the act? In other words, is it that guy who killed that person or some other guy? We need to know that. And then the next question is trying to figure out to the best that we can what the cause of that uh, act was. Imagine, for example, that um, what caused someone to kill somebody else is a tumor that developed uh, in their brain. There'd be a very easy way to fix that, remove the tumor and that'd be done. And then we'd say, look, if that's what the tumor did, then in remove it, that person is fully re re rehabilitated. It's not going to strike again, right? Whether he's morally responsible or not becomes completely irrelevant. Uh, the real question is, how likely is that person to strike again? And given our current understanding, the case of the brain tumor is sort of easy, but suppose you have now a psychopath, which somehow has a brain that doesn't function quite well. We can't fix that yet. But if we could, we would. And it wouldn't matter whether they're morally responsible or not. We would want to fix that person. Actually, not. that's a very interesting ethical question as to whether you would. I'm not so sure I well, agree with you. Or maybe destroy them. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't be inclined to destroy them. But, uh, no, but if you asked them and they said they didn't want oh, to be Oh, then changed. if they want to be destroyed, then that's a different question. Yeah, right. I agree. I agree. But so, to get back to the question, yes, I think we need moral responsibility as a notion in, in sort of general uh, circles, um, but in specific legal circles, we have to sort of get to, into higher gear and, and I think simply do away with it. It's a bit like, um, to give a quick analogy, um, in everyday life we can deal with physical interactions between physical things using classical mechanics. But in certain circumstances, we have to get a better theory. Like say, when we use our GPS devices, we have to now involve general relativity because satellites have to be adjusted every now and again uh, for time coordinates. Otherwise, we drive into, okay, but that's a special case. But in the general case, we don't need that fancy a theory. So, I, moral responsibility, yes, in the general sense. We don't need it in the, I, I know this is, radical, but I think it's perfectly defensible uh, to say we don't need it in, in, in legal settings. So that's what I would say. Anything? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I, I think that the, the notion of moral responsibility, it's tricky to work out on that sort of account. So if you say, well, look, it's the tumor, that's the explanation for it. Therefore, the agent's not responsible. Okay, well, now it's my cerebral cortex. Uh, Am I responsible then? I mean, under what condition? Which part is it that's such that if that part causes it, then we count it's responsible and not another part? So that's one question. But hold yeah, on a second. Going, yeah. That's one question. And then, then the other is, you know, can we really do away with this notion of moral responsibility? So some think yes. Look, all this stuff's controversial. But um, and here's just a very brief thought experiment. So um, the a, ter a terrible thought experiment, admittedly. So the police come to your house and they say. Uh, we, we need to let you know that your daughter has been raped and murdered. We have captured the person who's done it. However, um, there is a, um, a scientific procedure that we can undertake just by stimulating this person's brain in a certain way for just a couple of minutes. And once we do that, they'll, they'll never do it again. So if, if it's okay with you, we're just going to give them the magnetic stimulation and set them free. Is that okay? 
you t tell me what you think. I mean, I, I think that most of us think, no, look, there's something else that's gone on here, right? There's a wrong that's been done. And in order for justice to be done, something more has to happen than simply correcting the behavior of the wrongdoer. And so I think on this conception of moral responsibility, it's missing something. Now, there are a lot of people that don't like that thought experiment because they think it's tempting us to capitalize on um, the, the retributive part of our nature that we ought to resist. But others think, no, 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 that's not a part of our uh, nature that we ought to resist. Retribution is a perfectly uh, um, respectable normative notion that deserves a place in a world with free agents who engage in behaviors for which they're morally responsible. So you're, you're giving up a lot, and we have to ask ourselves, are we giving up more than we think we rationally ought to surrender? Can I respond with another quick thought? Exp oh, by experiment, or you have another question? Sure, and uh, then, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the two things really are orthogonal there. Uh, the causal responsibility and the issue of moral responsibility. Imagine the following thought experiment now. Um, you have a boulder that's been sitting on top of a hill for thousands of years. At the bottom of the hill is a village with, uh, with people uh, in, in the homes. Um, after a very violent storm, the, the boulder comes crashing down, flattens a number of homes and kills dozens of people. Suppose we added to that boulder one characteristic. It's just a regular boulder, but it can suffer the way we suffer. How much sense would it make to punish the boulder for what it did, to set it on fire and hit it with hammers to make it suffer because it killed people? What's your intuition about this? Would it make sense? Would you want to do that in that case, to punish the boulder, to make it suffer because it did what it did? Most people would say, not really. It doesn't really make sense. Right? So retribution is tricky, I think. I agree, but it really hinges at least intuitively, on this notion that we could, have done other, we could have done otherwise. And I think it hinges on a particular view of free will, which is scientifically suspect. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, a problem for retribution. Now, you might want to be retributive for other reasons, if it, for example, uh, has uh, consequences down the road and if it, if it prevents uh, future crime. That's a different kind of argument. Uh, but in the case that I think Michael gave, you, you can remove moral responsibility from the equation, the question would still arise. If the person is culturally responsible, what do we do with him? Forget about morally responsible, what do we do with him? Do we want to uh, give him the treatment or not? That, that moral responsibility is irrelevant in that case, it just doesn't enter the picture. It's other considerations that make us want to give him the treatment or not, not whether or not he was morally responsible. Because he is causally responsible, that's all we need to know. And then we need to figure out what to do with individuals like that. That's it, I think. As we draw to a close, um, at all of these events that I've been at, I've realized that there are fans and followers and readers of you guys in the audience, and they are here for you, actually. They came specifically to hear you. And so I'd like to end by asking each of you to pretend you're speaking to just one of them individually and give them your best wishes for their human flourishing. <laughs> wow. Jordy, will you start? Oh, I got to start? Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> <laughs> well. <you>. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can we skip me and go to Michael? You can, you okay. can look at it as advice. Here's, you I'm going to give you guys some wise advice, all right? Good. If you have young children, Restrict their screen use as much as you can uh, until as late as they can be. That's a piece of advice number one. Piece of advice number two, your happiness derives from your relationship with the people that you look in the eye, not your Twitter friends or your Facebook friends. As a subcategory of piece of advice number two, stop using social media. Okay. Go back, if you can, and I know not everybody can, go back to thinking locally. So when you buy food, when you think about where your water comes from, when you think about where your electricity comes from, when you think about where your friends are, think about the real people who are around you and, uh, and not the weird thing that happens on the internet. And my last piece of advice, um, is forgive the people around you for not being perfect. Because those 14 or 15 people that you really know well, 
will do things that really annoy you a lot all the time because they're like you, they're not perfect, but they're all that you've got. And when you, when you show them forgiveness and affection, you deepen the bonds that you have with them and they'll show that back to you. And at the end of the day, all that you've got are these personal connections with the people around you. So that's my advice to, the, uh, <laughs> to any fans that I might have Thank here. You. I think we can end here. This was beautiful and eloquent, <laughs> and um, I don't nice. have anything to add. My piece of advice is follow his advice. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not really in the business of giving advice. I, I'm a flawed human being, so I wouldn't really want to give advice to people. Um, perhaps what I would say is um, that I've thoroughly enjoyed this event, and one thing that I think I really appreciate about you guys here, about the people who organized it, is the willingness to um, bring together people with different points of view, um, to have civil uh, and polite and friendly and fun discourse without being at each other's throats. Uh, in today's world, I think that is critical. And I commend you all for coming to something like this, for listening to views that for some of you may not resonate very well, uh, for being patient, for being kind, for listening to other points of view, for engaging with us, that to me is very, very important. So I don't know if it's a piece of advice, but it's, I want to express my gratitude for, um, for this event and for this kind of dialogue. It's something I thoroughly enjoy. Um, I, I really enjoy being in events like this. I really enjoy interacting with other human beings. I really enjoy hearing other perspectives, especially so, to give you an example, I was talking to Michael earlier in the so-called green room that would love to get together with him and see exactly where it is that he and I diverge intellectually. It's fascinating to me. Uh, so if we could all do more of this, I think we probably would live in a much better world. Thank you. So, thank, thank you. you. Well, that was all pretty good advice, and especially from somebody who said he doesn't give advice. But I'm a philosopher, so I do get... No, <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, I think, um, really, I'll just reiterate something that I said before, that, uh, you know, as, as a Christian, I think that human well-being consists in two things. First of all, being good stewards of the creation that's been given to us. And I think we all recognize that that's not just a duty, but it's something in the doing of which we find genuine flourishing and happiness. Um, and the second and more important is uh, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. I think that, again, most of us recognize that in those profound moments of relationships of love and friendship that we have with one another, and for those who are believers in relationship with God, that's where we find our truest flourishing. But it's also true um, as a Christian, at least as Christians believe, that we live in a world that's broken that we live in a world that's afflicted by sin and that it uh, detracts from our flourishing. It keeps us from doing those things in a way that's, um, that allows us to be all of those things that God created us to be. And the remedy for that is to be related to God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And um, so th I think that's an important ingredient for human flourishing as well. So in addition to carrying out those mandates of stewarding the creation, and loving God and one another, um, I think what's important is for us to find our home and our rest in our relationship with Christ. Thank you. So we've come to the end of our time together. Uh, please join me once again to thank our three speakers. It was fascinating. So you're all invited to a reception and a visit with our guests at Wycliffe College. There will be some food and drink. I'm hoping there will be yogurt. Um, and thank you for joining us from the live stream spots. Please watch for upcoming religion and society events, and you can always find more information at wycliffecollege.ca. Thank you. <laughs>